Sunday and I am officially back from the national. I wanted to record a few videos today uh, before the work week started. I recorded my pickups video a little bit earlier today. I think it's gonna be after this video, uh, at least on the YouTube channel side of things, but uh, I'm not gonna really cover the pickups too much in here. Uh, what I'm really gonna talk about is kind of just some thoughts and observations from the show and talking to people. I kind of built out a brief list within the last 30 minutes or so, and I have 24 thoughts. I'm probably missing stuff. I'm not going to lie to you guys. I should have wrote down notes on a notebook every time I thought of something at the National. But regardless, I think there's enough here to talk about uh, just in general for the show this year. And uh, yeah, so I think the biggest situation that I saw on social media was kind of getting to the show itself because it was pretty hectic, right? I, I recorded a few videos for my National vlog walking to the card show because uh, me and Orlando, if you don't know Orlando, a collector's dream, we walked the show every single day, minus the first day when we both flew in uh, from the airport. Now, the reason why we walked, a hotel was two and a half miles away. So by the time you order a Lyft or Uber, then get into the Uber and then drive over, I mean, it would have been literally the same exact time. From what I heard, other people that were going to the show, it literally took them over an hour just to get in. And Look at it, two and a half mile walk. It took us, you know, 40 to 50 minutes each day. Uh, we made a long cut one day, but regardless, we got to the show a lot faster. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how you address the parking situation at this venue. I, I was talking to one of the Ubers on the last day at the show. We're going back to the airport. It was mentioning that this was the busiest he's ever seen the convention center. Uh, even all, there's a lot of boat shows. There's a lot of like travel shows, different things like that, and um, never seen it packed as it was the last few days. Awesome for the hobby, but that is a big pain point um, because it led to some issues, right? People getting to the show. But another issue was people leaving the show. Now, I didn't walk from the show. Uh, I walked, obviously, to it. But uh, leaving the show, it, it also was a kind of a pain. Some days I would have to wait about 30 minutes uh, to leave. But... One of the things that I really impacted, I have, have this on my notes, I got to cross this out, is some of the dealers. Uh, there was dealers that were packing up early just to beat the traffic. Now, there is a trade night at the National itself. It was downstairs. I did not attend any of those, but there were also kind of pop-up trade nights elsewhere. And some of the dealers just wanted to go home because it was a very long day at the show between setting up early in the morning and then uh, finishing at six o'clock. Most of the days, minus eight o'clock that first day for the preview. But uh, regardless, you did see dealers that started packing up at 4.35, 5.30. And look, it's not an issue right now because there's a ton of dealers in the room. But it's a little bit annoying if you want to go back to a booth and a dealer is packed up or not. And I don't know if the National controls that or what it really is. But regardless, just something I did want to call up is I did see quite a few booths that packed up kind of early. Um, so I'll cross that off on here. The next thing, a little a little bit of a pet peeve of mine is the cash only dealers. Now look, um, I understand why some dealers are cash only. And I think that should be applicable at a smaller card show. Maybe your local show, maybe a 100 table show max. But when you set up at the National, it's a premier card show, right? You have thousands upon thousands of people that travel a far distance to get to the show. You should be accepting more than just cash only. And I dealt with that with actually a lot of dealers at tables on the first day. And then other days they're like, I only accept cash. Well, you know, what happens if you spend all your cash and you still have PayPal balance or your bank balance that you want to spend? You're not going to close any deals. And I think from like the national perspective, there should be some enforcement of, you know, if you're going to set up at the national, you need to accept more payment methods than just cash. From Talking to dealers also, some say, oh, I just want to uh, accept cash so I don't have to report it. Mm, that's not really how it works. And the same people that say that will either deposit like slightly under $10,000 uh, multiple times, which you're going to get tracked just telling you from that perspective. But it's it, it's idiotic, in my opinion, only to accept cash. I mean, really, if you're setting up at the Premier Card Show out there, you need to accept at least PayPal or Venmo or Zelle. Uh, give other options besides cash. So... Uh, that's one of mine over there. Now, I did 
see a little bit more signage this year, but I still think the signage sucks at the show. R- really, what I think needs to happen, a few things. Number one, when I was walking through like the 900, 1,000, and 1,100 rows, sometimes I would see dealers on the same row that would have numbers 900, 1,000, and 1,100. Like They're all specific different rows, but the the dealer numbers and the booths, they didn't always line up specifically. Maybe it was just kind of how the layout of the show was. Um, but it was kind of weird. They only had just from memory, one large sign for each row. I just, I don't think that works properly. And also you had to ask each dealer what their booth number was because it wasn't displayed all the time. And just from like walking around, I, I was trying to find a few different booths and it was tough. It took me sometimes extra time. So I think there needs to be a clear way to show the booth number at each of these specific booths. And number one, Number two, I think there should be some sort of directory at the show. So think of kind of like a mall or like an airport where they have those directory maps and and you have that big bright red dot that says you are here and gives you kind of other ideas like, oh, go to this section if you want to find this, right? I, I think we need that at the national, like full large displays like that and maybe a few more other signs saying, okay, you're at the section, let's say 1050 in this row or 1025 or whatever, or all the dealer booths have their numbers displayed more prominent because it, it was tough. And you, and a lot of people were asking dealers all the time, oh, what booth are you? Okay, I have to try to find this booth and continue to walk through it. And look, it, it's not as bad as a layout as kind of like Chicago. It's kind of a one pet peeve of the Chicago uh, National. I, I like the location the best, but... um. Yeah, we just really need more signs and kind of a better layout. And yeah, we just really need more signs. I'm not going to cut out that mistake, but uh, um, all right. Next thing on here, I already have leaving show early. Yeah, I mean, ranking wise, I've been to five different national card shows now. This is my second favorite location. My favorite location is still Chicago. You have all the hotels there. You have food options nearby. Layout is kind of iffy, but... Uh, internet works decently well, at least with T-Mobile, which is what I have. And uh, I kind of like that. Cleveland, I'd put second best. I didn't mind the venue. I thought it was okay. Uh, there's a few other issues, which I'll go through on the, this list. Uh, and last, I would put Atlantic City. So that's kind of where I, I rank this show in comparison. I haven't been to all the different other locations, like some of the other vintage dealers. Um, but at least in the last five years or so, five or six years, uh, those are my th- uh, three rankings. Okay. Uh, one issue what I've I've seen a lot on social media was the lack of variety of dealers. Now, uh, people kind of had a simplistic viewpoint on this one saying there's not enough modern uh, at the show and there's a big amount of vintage. Now, granted, anytime I go to an Ohio card show, the clientele is vintage dealers, right? And I, I've been to a few. I've been to a show in Cincinnati. I've gone to Strongsville and I've also been to a show in Columbus. So uh, there is a, quite a few national dealers that set up at all these local shows. And I wouldn't necessarily call them local shows because they are bigger than your typical local shows, uh, especially Strongsville, Cincinnati, and the Columbus show, which does expand, I think, once or twice a year. But regardless, that's kind of the customer base if you go to an Ohio card show. I know they have like one modern show. What is it? Xenia show or something like that. I've never been to that one, so I can't tell you specifically on that specific show. But regardless, it tends to be a vintage-heavy crowd at the shows that I've personally attended. Now, a lot of people, again, on social media were complaining, oh, there's not enough modern, there's not enough modern. Walking around, I saw a decent amount of modern. Now, vintage obviously dominated. I would say it's probably about 70% vintage, 30% modern. The modern guys probably want to have it flipped, right? 70% modern, 30% vintage. Here's my perspective on it. I think you could have had a little bit less vintage, but instead of more modern, there needs to be other sports and other categories that are represented at the national. One of my favorite things to collect is vintage non-sports cards and foreign issue cards. There wasn't much there. Now I knew there's a few dealers that set up. There was Doyle that set up that had non-sports cards. There was Uncommon. Uh, There was a few other people that had non-sports cards, but they're from the 50s and 70s, not really pre-war. So I really only had two different options to look for uh, pre-war non-sports cards. And I've even gone to foreign issues as well. Both of them had a little bit of it. 
but you didn't really have any dealers that had a bunch of Ogden Guinea Golds from the UK, or you didn't really have uh, dealers that had a bunch of French trade cards or German trade cards, etc. And look, I know it is super niche, but like when you think of the national, you think of all these other different categories. In fact, one of the things that kind of popped up because of this issue was a, a kind of like a hybrid between a card show and a trade night. Um, it was like the SoCo Expo and they had it, I think three or four different days. Uh, and it was like five or 10 miles away from the national. I, I can't remember specifically, but it was mainly soccer collectors because if walking around the show, there was very little soccer. Again, there was a few different dealers. Uncommon had soccer cards and saw maybe one or two others, but that was not represented. Hockey also not really represented, uh, just a handful of dealers. And look, I get it. We're in the United States. Hockey is way more popular in Canada, especially if you go to the, the Toronto Expo. But again, if we call the show the National, I, I really think that we need to have other types of cards represented there because without that soccer trade night, I don't think a lot of those people would have even went to the National just because they're not going to find the cards that they like. And soccer is a huge category. Hockey is a huge category. You can't find that type of stuff. Vintage non-sports is slowly becoming a big category. There, there was no cricket cards at the show. And I know cricket is even more niche than uh, vintage non-sports cards, but there's starting to be a lot of people that collect cricket cards out of Australia, you know, even India, and also the UK. And they, it has a long history of collection collecting all the way back through the 1800s. So if you really want to expand the hobby, I think there needs to be more diversity at the show. And really maybe the national, instead of like a lottery, there should be some sort of system to allow other types of dealers out there. So maybe if you're, you really focus on cricket cards, the national only has... The National doesn't have any cricket collector um, type dealers right now, but if they want to add one in, uh, maybe if you're a prominent cricket collector and you have hundreds of cards to sell, they can give you a boot out of that side of things just to kind of expand out the show. Uh, I did see a few dealers that only had type one photos, which I don't know anything about type one photos yet. It's something I do want to explore in the future. I think that was cool to see because I can't remember that from other national card shows or even just local shows. Like you don't see type one photo dealers. And I know it has its place in the hobby. It's really expanded over the last few years. Um, that's, that's a good thing, right? That we have type one, but maybe there's other type one photo dealers that should be in the national, maybe five, 10 dealers. Give those type of type one photo collectors an opportunity to purchase more cards. There's a lot of fifties through seventies baseball. And I'm not hating on that category because I understand it's the backbone of not only that card show, but the hobby, the 50s through 70s baseball collectors, they've been in the hobby 20, 30 years. They're the ones that propped up the national. They're the ones that propped up this industry because they are the diehard collectors. They're the most serious collectors in the hobby. But I really do think that we need to expand out the category of dealers at the national. So that way everyone can have some sort of representation. So that's at least my kind of rant on the dealer selection and kind of the soccer trade night as well. Um, talking to dealers, by the way, everyone was super happy with their sales. Uh, I, I tried asking how sales compared to last year and I didn't get exact answers on that side of things, but everyone was like, I'm doing phenomenal on sales. There's a lot of people buying stuff and, uh, it was really good. Surprisingly, some of the Olympic stuff wasn't moving as much as I thought, um, from talking to the more niche dealers. And I've even noticed that on this channel because I tried building out an Olympics series like what cards sell on eBay and there wasn't as much. I feel like in the past, some of these Olympics, uh, there was a lot of Jesse Owens cards that were selling and granted in the series there is, but they didn't move as much as I thought at the national and they didn't move as much as I thought on eBay. I thought it would be seeing a lot more sales, not just Jesse Owens, but other prominent Olympians. But regardless, that's just kind of some of the thoughts on that side of things with sales. Everyone was very, very happy. It wasn't very slow or anything like that. From a buying perspective, I saw a, uh, or not I saw, but dealers were giving more discounts this year. Some of the past national card shows, dealers would not take a dime off their price or they'd take off 5%. I had a lot of people taking 20% off, 25% off when I built out bigger lots, even all the way up to 30% off. Uh, some were a little bit more strict and maybe only took five or 10% off. I don't think I really paid any sticker prices, um, which is good to see, right? Because there needs to be some sort of bartering at these type of shows. And some dealers are going to be over comps on their stickers, but that's normal. You have to start 
somewhere and then you can always work down. Um, I did overhear some conversations, which are funny on comps, uh, like overheard a card was selling for 4,500, someone offered them 48. And again, I didn't look at the specific card, so I, I can't tell you if this was accurate or not. And the dealer would not budge from $6,000. So there is still that out there. I'm not saying every single dealer will take a little bit off or work with you, but uh, I just want to say from walking around and making deals, it felt like dealers were more loose with their prices and really willing to work out deals. Maybe it's a little bit of a threat of the economy and always on election years, it's kind of interesting on that side of things. But regardless, uh, I, I was very happy to do that because you, you're able to make more deals and you're able to buy more cards. Okay. Um, I did not go to the main trade night this year, but it was downstairs. I did heard it was kind of a disaster with letting people in. They had some sort of wristband system. Again, this is just everything I've heard. I did not experience this firsthand. So take everything with a grain of salt, but there's like some sort of wristband situation that you had to get wristbands to get into the trade night. There was like a limited amount of people that were technically allowed in to the trade night. So people had to wait outside for other people to leave. And then once people left, they were allowed in. Uh, also, I heard if you ended up showing up like two or three hours later into that trade night, you were able to go in there um, without a line. But if you try to get in there as soon as six o'clock hit or eight o'clock on that first day, there were some issues. Uh, getting in with long lines. Um, again, I wasn't at the trade night, so I have no idea what was on the floor at the trade night or how bad those lines were or how packed it was. I assume it pretty was because uh, you had to get the wristband and um, apparently it was over an hour wait sometimes to get in there. So I think with like Chicago, how you have all those hotels right outside of the national, it alleviates a lot of the situation with hotels being two or three miles at least uh, far away from this specific card show. It it was kind of tough to have those pop-up trade nights happen. I mean, one of the things I loved with Chicago is going from hotel to hotel, seeing what was happening at those hotels and kind of trading based around that. So that was that side of things. Oh, another kind of funny comment, and I kind of observed it, and I was talking to other collectors about it, is you can kind of classify a collector with what they're carrying their cards in. And I thought about it, and you know, this theory is kind of true. So there's three different ways that people are really carrying cards. Uh, first, you have the backpack collectors. I'm one of the backpack collectors. I always carry around a backpack at all the shows. And the backpack guys tend to be more vintage collectors. They don't really sell that many cards. Um, I do sell cards, but granted, I don't go around the show selling cards to dealers and stuff like that. They buy cards, they put in their backpack, and they call it a day. Next, you have the fanny pack collector. I have your fanny pack right over here or across your waist. <laughs> Those type of collectors tend to have just a few cards, but they tend to be pretty high end, a few thousand dollars. <laughs> Surprisingly, that lined up quite well. And then you have the Zion case guys, which are the oddballs. Um, but it could be all vintage in that case. It could be modern. It could be mixed. But those are the guys that are going to always be willing and dealing at the show. And, you know, it lines up pretty well. I mean, let me know what your experience is dealing with all these type of people on how they store cards. But I thought it was a pretty funny stereotype. And someone told me that at a uh, trade night, I was thinking about it for a while. I'm like, I definitely have to share it because I think it is an accurate stereotype. Okay, uh, what's next on here? Another kind of a funny story that happened to me is I sold a card to the, the hotel receptionist who didn't even collect cards. So when I was checking in the first day, I had a huge kind of bargain bin that I purchased. I, I bought quite a lot of cards I was gonna send to Comsi. And I was walking to the hotel with there with all that reception. What's in there? Cards? Yeah. Any Michael Jordan cards? My husband collects. Yeah. So I pull out a Michael Jordan card. And this is like a dollar, two dollar cards. And I sold it to the hotel receptionist for two dollars. I um, never would have expected to sell a card to a hotel receptionist that doesn't collect cards. But everything happens. And uh, I thought that was a, a pretty funny thing on that side of things. All right. Uh, up next is the bathroom situation. Again, it's probably been covered a million times, but just from experience, you know, the bathrooms were pretty far away from places. Uh, I saw that there were some other bathrooms that were opened up over time, but I didn't really study the floor map. I just continued to go to the one bathroom on the main floor all the way in the back, right? The line was a bit long, it would, but it would take you maybe five or 10 minutes to go downstairs, use the restroom and finish it 
Um, the other side of things with longer lines was food. Now, there was a ton of food trucks at the National, but I didn't try any of them. From what I heard, and I, I saw some of the prices, I didn't look at every single one, but the pizza was $8 a slice. So if you wanted to get a full pizza, I mean, you're looking at what? I, I, it really depends on how they cut the pizza, whether it's six, eight, or 10 slices. But regardless, man, if I'm spending $50 plus on a full pizza, I expect to have truffle on there. I expect to have some really, really nice high-end ingredients. I don't expect that for a, a cheese or a pepperoni's pizza. Um, it probably tastes okay. I mean, uh, man, I don't even think uh, like a 9.1 on a Dave Portnoy scale is worth $50 for a pizza. But regardless, it's uh, the prices were kind of crazy and the lines were crazy as well. Um, that, and that's why I elected to skip lunch every day. Was I hungry? Absolutely. Because every day minus the last day at the National, ran in the morning and walked a lot. So I was starving, but I skipped all those meals uh, just because the line was long and I didn't want to spend $8 on a slice of pizza. But uh I think if you were really hungry and you wanted to take it, I think it's a good thing that there's more food options at the venue, but the lines are kind of a turnoff. So there's that side of things. Also during the show, eBay search was down, which was kind of annoying when you're trying to find some stuff, like if it's already listed on eBay or some sold prices. Look, I use also other pricing apps as well to get my best price ideas. Not always the comps on eBay make it to those pricing apps. And you can't see always what's for sale specifically at the time. So I, I tried to use multiple data points, but it was a, a bit annoying that eBay was down. The other thing that was down quite a bit was the Wi-Fi. So uh, again, my mobile carrier is T-Mobile. It worked okay at times, but also T-Mobile was down quite a bit. And there was multiple times where it took me 20 or 30 minutes just to get a payment across through PayPal just because of the Wi-Fi going in and out, in and out. And it happened to a lot of people. I saw that. Uh, apparently it wasn't as bad as Atlantic City. T-Mobile was good for me in Atlantic City, but I heard other uh, mobile carriers just did have like zero signal in the AC hall. Again, I had a little bit, but I just, there's like a few times where I had to try sending a payment seven times for it to go through. And it finally did. So there were some issues with that side of things on the Wi-Fi. I do hope it gets improved at future national card shows. Personally, I, I don't think I ha ever had any issues in Chicago and I know it's there for the next three years, but I really hope uh, at least the national committee and team can work on improving that, especially with how many people are there. And I get it from the IT perspective. It's very hard to build all that type of infrastructure, right? But uh, I think it's needed for these type of shows, especially with all those electronic payments. And eventually, right, I think all these dealers should be accepting electronic payments, not just these cash only dealers. But I've already talked about that. Points. All right. Uh, some of the things that I kind of saw or heard about as well, I'm going to kind of just lump in the video. Uh, first is Burbank Cards putting all their inventory on Fanatics Collect. Very interesting on my perspective. I mean, their, their inventory is split up, I believe, on Beckett and it was eBay. So 40 million cards going to Fanatics Collect. The first thing that I thought of is they're trying to compete with ComC because Burbank sells a lot of like 50 cents or dollar or $2 cards. And now that's getting flooded over to Fanatics Collect. What will be interesting to see is the storage fee associated with Fanatics Collect. Like, okay, you have a dollar card that you're trying to sell. What's the storage fee on there? I know they mentioned that there's like a 5% uh, sale on that side of things. And then I'm not too sure if they're changing their payout structure. I, I know PWCC had some sort of payout structure. I, I haven't really, really sold a lot of stuff on PWCC. Just few items I flipped once at an auction, but regardless, it seems like they may be going after ComC on the cheap route. It'll be interesting to see what happens over the next few months if they announce like, you know, kind of ComC-ish type of stuff, but um, it's still super early. But that was my initial thought when uh, Burbank moved over 40 million cards, and I, I kind of expect some other announcements within uh, the next few months. So... There is that side of things. Also, there was a ton of live breaks. PSA had one, and there's all the whatnot breakers and things like that. I personally did not watch any live breaks. I really don't open much wax, and it doesn't really interest me as much. I opened wax as a kid. I think it's still fun to do, but I'm not going to sit there and spend time doing that. But I did see someone pull an Atomic Otani rookie card. It was like numbered to 100 autograph, and it came back a PSA 10. So 
I think that was from a free break as well. So it's kind of awesome to see someone win essentially a lottery ticket type of card in one of those. And uh, in the video I watched, I think the breaker said it was a $30,000 or $40,000 card. I don't follow the Otani market, but if so, man, that's that's an awesome win on that side of things. All right. Another thing which was really cool to see, and it happens every national, is some of the memorabilia uh, that was present at the show. There's some Wizard of Oz artifacts they're like the famous uh, slippers. And uh, the other thing, which was really awesome, was the 1932 Babe Ruth called shot jersey. Now, there are some people online saying it's not the specific jersey. There's other people that say that is the jersey. I believe the story goes that it's the actual jersey from the 1932 season. Uh, but some people are questioning if it was used in that specific game or not. Look, I don't know a thing about jersey authentication or fat authentication or anything like that to do with game used memorabilia. Um, but regardless, if it was that Jersey on that specific game, awesome to see if it wasn't, it's still a game used Babe Ruth Jersey in full, which is still cool. The one thing which someone pointed out to me on Babe Ruth's shoulder, there is a bit of wear, and apparently it was just how Babe Ruth held his bat. Since he held his bat backwards, it would rub right against the shoulder and that's why the jersey was uh, pretty thin in that area and it had a, essentially almost a hole there. And uh, I saw that, but I didn't know. I mean, I assumed there was some sort of reason with the bat, but it was kind of cool to hear the story. Like he would hold it all the way back over there and just from the whole season, uh, that's the why it would wear down quite a bit. There's so many other game used jerseys, game used shoes. Uh, there were some Olympic medals uh, all the way from the early, I want to say they had one from the first Olympic Games so that was a bronze. Now, someone might say, bronze it sucks but really there's only two medals in the first olympic games it got expanded out to three medals i want to say on the second or third games where we had the bronze silver gold which we know today but i believe it was just bronze and gold for the first games but seeing the original one at one of the auctions which i believe was rock and roll auctions was really sweet there's also a signed mark twain postcard there and all the full video going over most of the auction houses i didn't have time to record them all unfortunately um, I really didn't even have much time to check out every dealer booth. It just was that crazy hectic at this type of shows. But uh, that was uh, something I was really worth shouting out. There's also a lot of MV MVP, or not MVP, but championship rings there. There was some MVP awards there. I think they had one for Cepeda. And uh, it, it just, it's awesome just taking a look at all the memorabilia there. You don't see those all the time and you get a smile and say, this is a, really cool artifact there's i believe also a joe jackson game used bat there and uh, i really enjoyed seeing all that type of stuff okay so another thing that i noticed and just from talking to dealers we're going to talk about psc grading so this could be split into kind of two different things number one is the wait and turnaround times so i knew someone that brought in type one photos and autographs that they wanted to get authenticated by a psa again not cards i didn't talk to many people that uh, sent in cards that get graded on site. We'll talk about some of the crossover stuff a little bit, but uh, the photos promised one day, came back next day, not ready, came back the next day, not ready. Uh, so it's things that they purchased, or not purchased, but they purchased the essentially express grading the one day at the national turned into four days to get some of this stuff slabbed up, which again, just calling that out. I don't know if it was just the photo side of things or if it also impacted cards, but I assume so because some of the crossovers those took forever as well. Stuff that was promised pretty fast ended up taking multiple days. Um, speaking of crossovers, did talk to a few people that wanted to cross over slabs, whether it was like an SGC slab or a BGS slab. And essentially the crossover rate was very, very low. Now PSA was very generous and did a free review on all these cards and mentioned like what it would grade and point out any specific flaws that they saw or the grader saw. But the crossover rate was horrible. I think... And again, I don't have all the numbers, so don't take this for fact. But I think the crossover rate was probably anywhere from 10 to 20%, if that. I know a lot of people that were kind of 04 and had nothing that was crossed specifically. But if you did, uh, there could be a potentially a very big win on the new uh, value of the card because they were only taking a look at $10,000 plus cards. And sometimes moving from a BGS 9.5 to a PSA 10 is a huge value add depending on the market, because you have some people that really collect for a registry and they'll pay that premium for that specific card or like within specific card collectors, uh, there's a different type of multiplier. The hobby is very interesting on that side of things between sports 
uh, what people really value on brands, things like that. Like vintage baseball, PSA and SGC tend to be a little bit closer up until high grades because you have the registry collectors on pre-war side of things. They're very similar. But then when you go to other sports like basketball, PSA 10 really triumphs over like an SGC grade or a BGS grade. I just a lot of the more modern bros go towards that side of things. Again, that could be a full video talking about logistics of grading and why people send cards to specific companies. Not today though. So there is that side of things, both on the PSA. Um, all right, the Tito Six Hottest Wagner on the floor. I mean, man, people say that the PSA standards have not changed. Look at this PSA too. Tell me if that would get it to today. And that is all I'm going to say. Awesome to see a, a Wagner on the floor. Personally, I like the 1903 Wagner more than the T206. That's my opinion, not the hobbies, because the T206 outsells it. But regardless, tell me if that would still be a PSA to today. All right, and I was able to meet up with a few different companies over there. Uh, so I was able to meet some representatives of Heritage, as well as On Mantle and Comsey. Heritage was telling me that they're really trying to grow out the non-sports side of things. And obviously, I have a great interest on the non-sports. I'm not going to talk about all the specifics there, but... Uh, I think it's awesome that they're investing on the non-sports because I still think it's quite neglected within the hobby. Then I talked to on Mantle. They sponsored my national video and I do have an affiliate link for them. So if you want to check out on Mantle, the, essentially what they're trying to do is build out a social media platform for more collectors. It doesn't just have to be card collectors. It can be anything like if you collect autographs or you collect game use memorabilia or Pokemon or whatever, right? They're trying to build a platform based around that. So you want to join, make sure to check out down below. I'm going to be making a few posts on rare cards, talking about the history of those cards on the platform. And I'll share off other stuff as well within my collection because I think it's another way uh, to network. And I do have other social media accounts just for hobby related things. So if I can just post on there and I can find more things for my PC, I think it's 100% worth it. You never know who joins these type of platforms. So Link is down below again. It is affiliate, but it is 100% free for you to join. And there's no paid services as of 2024 summer on the platform. There may be in the future, but right now when I'm making this video, there's not. I also got to meet with ComC. Uh, they were showing off a new beta site and I had essentially an hour where we walked through their new beta site and gave them suggestions. Now, I'm not going to specifically say all the suggestions I made on their site, but there's some stuff I definitely want to see added. And I talked to them about some of the pain points that vintage collectors and non-sports non collectors do deal with on their platform. So I do hope they are addressed within the future. I think everyone had a pretty good time at the National. Obviously there was a little bit of issues with the bathroom as well as the Wi-Fi and getting in and out of the venue. But I think it was a smooth show for the new team that took over uh, the management of the show. And look, I had a great time. I enjoyed my National experience. And honestly, I'm super stoked that the Chicago show is going to be three years in a row. I don't know the locations that they're trying to vote on for the year after. I don't even know if it's been announced yet. I tried talking to a few dealers and they said they haven't voted yet. Could be wrong, but regardless, that was it for uh, my national thoughts. If you want to check out some of my pickups as well as the vlog. Those are coming soon, but make sure to stay tuned for those on the channel. And if you're new, make sure to subscribe. All right, I will see you guys next time.